Good evening, friends. Grace and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Stephen Cook. I serve as the Dean of the Cabinet and District Superintendent of the East and West Jackson District. I also serve alongside Jason Zebert as co-convener of the District Realignment Task Force. Jason is doing a great job in helping us to navigate through the logistics of this important work of the District Realignment Task Force. With that said, I want to share what is the District Realignment Task Force? The District Realignment Task Force is a 10-person ad hoc task force that consists of five clergy and four laity with support of three ex officio members. The group work has consisted of analyzing how our current district would be best organizing, including a number of districts to help local churches move forward, considering today's context. The District Realignment Task Force has also examined the relationship of the district superintendents, secretaries with the local churches. The district task force, district realignment task force members consist of the following uh, names. Reverend Paulette Buford James, district superintendent for the Starkville and Greenwood District, Cheryl Denley, Senatoba District, Senatoria District Secretary, Reverend Mike Hicks retired clergy and former district superintendent. Yours truly, Reverend Dr. Stephen Cook, East Jackson, West Jackson, district superintendent. Reverend Smith Lilly, associate pastor, Tupelo First United Methodist Church. Sandra Raspberry, layperson, East Jackson district and clergy spouse of a former district superintendent. Andrew Richardson, layperson, Meridian district. Reverend Emily Sanford, pastor, Wesley UMC, Tupelo district. Vera Thomas, District Lay Leader, Seashore District. Ex officio members, Reverend Dr. Jason Zebert, Faith Community Formation Assistant Director and Pastor of Flexus Chapel and Bethany UMC. Latoria Red Thompson, Conference Lay Leader and David Stotts, Layperson Conference Treasurer and Chief Benefits Officer. Tonight, we will hear the following presentations from our panelists as a part of this district realignment informational webinar. Why purpose of the district realignment task force by Reverend Mike Hicks, process of arriving at the recommendation for the district realignment task force by Reverend Emily Sanford and recommendations and what is next by Latoya Red Thompson. We've also allotted time for questions and answers at the end of this presentation, of these presentations. Please type your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. We'll address questions submitted in the Q&A section. The webinar is being recorded for future viewing purposes. Before we hear from our presenters, let us open with prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you have enabled us to come together via this District Realignment Task Force informational webinar. We ask that you preserve us with your mighty power, but it's in you that we live, move, and have our being. We humbly pray for your guidance. Oh God, let the presentations given tonight and answers to questions convey clarity, vision, and understanding. Amen and amen. amen. Reverend Mike Hicks, Reverend Emily Sanford, Victoria Thompson will now give presentations in that order. Good to see you this evening. And most of you will recall the fairy tale Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And uh, Goldilocks goes on a walk in the woods and she finds a home there and she knocks on the door, no one answers. She opens the door 
and goes in and she sees three bowls of porridge on the kitchen table and she tastes the first bowl and it's too hot. The second bowl is too cold and the third bowl is just right. And so she gobbles it all down. Then she looks for a place to sit for a while and rest. And in the first chair is just too big and the second chair is just too squishy. And finally in the third chair, she finds a chair that's just right and she sits and rests for a while, but then she grows sleepy and, and she sees there's a bedroom and she goes into the bedroom and, and she tries out the beds there. The first one is much too hard. The second one is much too soft and the third one is just right. And so she snuggles into the bed and falls fast asleep. The work of the District Realignment Task Force began over 18 months ago. The charge for the task force was to determine the just right number of districts for the Mississippi Annual Conference. The focus of our work was how many districts are needed to effectively and efficiently support the work of the local church in making disciples of Jesus Christ. And yes, there was a district study team a little over a decade ago that looked at the number of districts and quickly decided to stick with the status quo of 11 districts. But think about this, much has changed in the over 30 years since we set the, the present districts in place. The geography of the local church across Mississippi has changed. The work of the chief missional strategist or district superintendent has changed in over 30 years. How we communicate has changed. We moved from snail mail and answering services to emails, text, Zoom, and cell phones. And then you throw into the mix the whole thing of a global pandemic that lasted over two years, and you see so much has changed over the years. I remember the very first thing I received from Cokesbury when I was ordained as a clergy in the Mississippi Conference was a little black day planner that fit in my pocket. I could put it in my coat pocket or I could put it in my shirt pocket. And, and it was so nice to have that little black book because I could write in all the important dates that I had. I could track my visits from day to day and track my business miles in that little black book. And I would go to my office and I would dutifully take out my day planner from my pocket. And then I would sink in the dates with my Pokesbury church planning calendar that was on my desk. And of course, by sinking, I mean, I had to write them in by hand. There was no such thing as sinking in those days. And, and all of that changed with the advent of the smartphone. I did not need to worry about syncing my calendar by hand. It does it automatically now. I had an app to keep track of my business mouths now. And so all of these changed. And and even Cokesbury doesn't even provide this pocket calendar any longer. It's been over a decade since they even tried to sell one, let alone give them away. <laughs> and as you know, Cokesbury now doesn't even have a bricks and mortar store any longer. See what change has happened over the years. And so we are trying to live not in the past, but in the present and leaning into the future. And so in light of all the change around us, the focus on the task force was not upon the past, but the future of the Mississippi Annual Conference and its churches. Our why was establishing a just right number of districts to meet the needs of churches, clergy, and laity for ministry in a very new world. And Emily, I'll turn it over to you now to talk about the process. Thank you, Mike. Yes, and thank you for taking time out of your night to be a part of this webinar uh, to learn more. Um, our team has been meeting monthly uh, and engaging this work uh, with uh, a great seriousness and a great uh, humility. Um, and we've considered a variety of different sources in making our recommendation. And I want to take a little bit of time just to give you a glimpse into that process. Um, I imagine that some of the type of discernment that we've been doing is very similar to the discernment and work that you're doing at a local level in your own church with your own ministries to try to consider the people that you have, 
uh, to consider uh, the resources that you have. And as you anticipate the future, um, what is going to work best at this time? Uh, and essentially, that's what we've tried to do with a big picture with our conference and our district uh, and to try to make sure we can align those things um, with the mission and ministry that we're called to. I can assure you that our team has bathed our efforts in prayer, um, and we have uh, definitely uh, taken this task very seriously. We've looked at um, other conferences across the connection, especially in the Southeast jurisdiction, um, and learned a lot from some of those efforts um, to try to see how they have adjusted the number of their districts, as well as the expectations um, that they have for those district superintendents and how they can operate to allow more ministry for the local church. We've also looked at different factors that are particular to Mississippi and the way our districts have operated, uh, the different uh, differences between our districts in terms of the number of churches, number of charges, budgets, the number of elders and local pastors, average worship attendance, all of those kind of criteria. And I, I want to direct you back to uh, the conference website on our realignment page where you can go through a lot of the, the data that we have looked at. Um, if you really want to dig deeply into that yourself, um, it's available for you there. Uh, but just for instance, uh, as we look at the current picture of our districts, uh, the West Jackson district is currently the district with the fewest number of churches uh, at 64 churches, which equates to 62 charges. Now, Meridian is the one with the greatest number of churches, and it is at 102. Uh, but that corresponds to only 56 charges. So see, there's fewer charges in the Meridian District than the West Jackson. Um, so that just gives you an idea of just some of the differences in different parts of our state. And uh, again, as we look back, uh, Mike was talking earlier about even 10 years ago, if we look back to 2004, at some of those numbers. Uh, seven out of the 11 districts at that time uh, had 100 or more churches that were being served within that district and with an average of 106 churches per district. And at that time, Meridian still had the most number of churches with 137 churches. So as we look at that picture and we consider that we currently have about 850 churches uh, in our conference, and anticipating some of the disaffiliations, uh, church closures that would be approved at this annual conference, we're most likely looking at having much closer to 700 churches by the time we get to July of 2023. So if we have around 700 churches and seven districts, that would allow about 100 churches per district. Uh, which is comparable, again, as we look back to 2004. Um, so within the last 10 years, uh, that's been a reasonable amount of churches that have been covered by a district superintendent. We know that there'll be some adjustments. Those are things that we've had lots of conversation about. Um, how do we make those adjustments uh, as smooth as possible? And as you know, already um, our cabinet has been uh, really giving some time to try out some different scenarios. Uh, they've been covering some expanded areas this last year. And we believe that we can actually streamline those district operations where they're not having to relate to multiple district committees, uh, rather one single district leadership team or uh, DCOM, district committee on ordained ministry or uh, lay leaders and such. And that cutting out some of that duplication will actually uh, allow them to work more effectively and more efficiently. We have a subgroup of our committee that is working specifically with these district operations and trying to help all of that um, happen as smoothly as possible. If our proposal is approved, they're ready uh, to step into that and lead. Last year, we conducted surveys, uh, a whole series of surveys with our current and former district superintendents. Uh, we also surveyed conference and district staff, as well as any laity, any clergy. We, we, we cast the net wide and you responded. Um, and we took those results uh, and we analyzed them and looked at them. And uh, they're also available on the website for those that want to see more of that. And uh, as we received our new bishop, uh, in January, Bishop Sharma Lewis has met with our team multiple times each month, uh, 
not multiple times each month. She's met with us multiple <laughs> times over the last few months. Yeah. And uh, she has given us some great insight from her experiences, both in North Georgia, as well in the Virginia conference, where she's been a part of some realignment efforts. And that has been insightful as we've uh, considered what's right for Mississippi. Um, and so we've stayed in close communication uh, with our district secretaries, and they have been a tremendous um, asset and provided so much information for us that's been helpful in our decision making. And we're grateful for their investment in this process. We want to value and care for them throughout this process. Some of you, uh, again, you've, you've given us questions that we consider anytime you've emailed us uh, or put uh, questions out in the formats that we've given. Uh, some folks have asked, okay, with all of these disaffiliations, have y'all actually taken that into account? The answer is yes. Uh, some people have questioned, should we wait until after all of those to know how many churches we would have? Uh, and our team feels very strongly uh, that, that this is the right time. Yes, we've, we've got to take these into account. Um, and yes, we can't know for sure that number and what it will be uh, in December, uh, but that we have time uh, to, you know, vote on this at annual conference this year and make those adjustments uh, based on the number of churches that we have to come up with the best configuration. Um, and we certainly are taking all of those moving pieces into consideration uh, as we do this work. And we're looking at the big picture. I mean, where are the places that uh, people are traveling, uh, where are the economic centers, where are the schools and community centers and cultural regions, all of that is going to weigh into what this actually will look like. So we've heard from you, and I think the biggest concern that we've heard and that we want to make sure that we keep as a value is how will we stay connected? How will we value those relationships that are so important? Uh, and I think that uh, by being smaller, I think that we'll a be able to achieve that goal. And I think that uh, we want to keep that at the forefront of the work that we do. So I hope this gives you just a, just a small snapshot of the discernment that we have done over the months together uh, and that has informed the recommendation that we have brought to you. And again, if you want to know more, uh, we are all open to conversation, any member of our team, you can email us, you can visit our website. Uh, we certainly uh, want to continue to engage this work together and make sure that everyone, uh, you know, we've got a chance for you to answer, uh, put questions in the chat that we'll even answer tonight uh, for those that are watching live and uh, certainly can include those in uh, our frequently asked questions that'll be on our website as well. We're hopeful uh, and excited about the future Mm -hmm. um, our, our team certainly, uh, you know, has, it's been inspiring to do this work together. And we trust that these uh, recommendations may help us move forward uh, mm -hmm. to make disciples in the future. So uh, we, we truly have uh, been honored to do this work on behalf of the conference and uh, hope, that, uh, hope that you'll be on board as well. Thanks, Emily. Um, and I am Latoya Red Thompson and the conference lay leader. As a conference lay leader, I want to sip in a send a special shout out to all the lay people um, who serve, <laughs> yes, who serve on this district realignment task force um, and the time and the commitment and the dedication that they have uh, committed to this work, as well as to all the annual conference lay delegates who are hopefully joining us this evening or will watch the recording. Uh, in preparation for the important vote that I'll be discussing in just a moment. So thank you so much to all the clergy and especially the lay. <laughs> so as you heard from Emily, the District Realignment Task Force, or DRT, has spent a lot of time considering various data points and perspectives in order to arrive at a recommendation. And after the detailed process that Emily so well described, the DRT has arrived at a recommendation. If you listen carefully, you heard her say it. But that the best number to facilitate the Mississippi Annual Conference making disciples at this time and under these circumstances would be seven. So let's talk about what will happen um, after this recommendation of seven districts is presented to the Annual Conference this summer. 
Paragraph 415.4 uh, of the United Methodist Book of Discipline states that the number of districts is determined by the vote of the annual conference. So if you're an annual conference delegate, clergy, or lay, that is you. And that is a huge decision. The number of districts affects not only clergy, but every clergy and every lay person in our annual conference. It will affect things such as the resources available to every local church at that level between the local church and the annual conference. It will affect uh, which local churches and how many local churches are connected within each district. And the number of districts will also affect how our bishop can extend himself or herself through our district superintendents. So the purpose uh, for the work of the DRT was to do legwork that could inform this decision, that could inform the annual conference as to the number of districts that would coincide with the practical needs and logistics of making disciples in our annual conference. So in addition to a decision on the number of districts which the annual conference will make, there also has to be a decision made on district boundaries. So as for the determination of district boundaries, paragraph 415.4 of our Book of Discipline also speaks to that. And it says that after the annual conference votes on the number of districts, that the district boundaries will be formed by the bishop after consultation with the district superintendents. We'll also have uh, new district names and a process will be determined um, and communicated to you concerning the naming of districts that takes into account the thoughts and suggestions of the local church members um, and our clergy in each new district. Of course, we also have to consider our district superintendents, who we love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we currently have eight district superintendents serving and one will roll off due to serving the maximum time, which will leave us with seven district superintendents. If the annual conference decides to adopt the DRT recommendation of having seven districts in our annual conference, we will have one district superintendent per district ratio. And then we certainly don't wanna forget, last but not least, our district staff and our district leadership on our various committees. Now, there are several unknowns concerning district staff and leadership. However, and you will be able to see this when the FAQ is posted, the DRT has attempted to think through these scenarios as much as possible about how district staff and district leadership will be affected and how they will transition. We've tried to think about this in a considerate way that respects these persons and each of their contributions to their district, very important contributions. So, DRT members have been in conversation uh, with district secretaries, the extended cabinet, and the board of lady to ensure that elected, appointed, um, and hired staff who are most likely to be the touch points across the conference have been informed about this process, as well as the recommendation and the next steps. As Emily indicated, we want to be in conversation, we want to continue to be in conversation. So we will continue to be in conversation um, with those groups as well as with you as with the annual conference as a whole. We will continue to email and we will continue to put out information about what's going on with this process. And we welcome your input about this process and the decisions um, that have been mentioned. And the next step for you um, as annual conference delegates, if you're clergy or lay, is to stay informed about this process. Mm -hmm. Watch this webinar. You might want to watch it multiple times. Read your pre-conference journal. Listen to the presentation that will take place at annual conference about this process, about this recommendation, about the impact of it. Um, those are some of the next steps that we will be taking and that we hope you will be taking, that we will take together to arrive at a good place for our annual conference. Ready and good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Latoya, Emily, and Mike, for your presentations. Now we'll move to a time of Q&A, questions and answers. We have some uh, questions that have been previously submitted, so we want to address those questions first, and then we'll take up questions from our Q&A section. The first question is, why all the changes as it relates to the number of districts 
that we currently have versus this recommendation. Mike, if you will address that question. I think I, I alluded to that a little bit in my presentation, but just the fact that we've seen such a dramatic change. Remember, we set the current number of districts in uh, 30 something years ago, and much has changed over that time. We've gone from over 1,200 churches now down to about 850 churches, anticipating we may be down to about 700 churches by the time we complete annual conference this year. So that, that's been a big driving force in our decision making. And, and then the fact that Emily talked about the, the differences in the number of churches and districts, it's just over time, this has happened because of number of closures of churches, just because people aren't there any longer. And so uh, some districts have a lot more churches and a lot fewer churches. And, and the clergy are kind of um, maybe not properly totally aligned in terms of all those districts as well. And so we felt like this is the time, this is the, the moment for us to address this very important matter to, to distribute our leadership and to support the work of the local churches best by going from 11 districts to seven districts. Thank you so much, Mike, uh, for your answer to that question. Another question that comes uh, to our attention tonight is how will reducing district offices help better guide our clergy and churches? Will this be more on the district superintendents? Emily, will you address that question, please? I'll be happy to. Uh, and I think it's a very fair question and a, one asked out of great concern. Uh, you know, there's certainly uh, some ways that our current structure is more work. Uh, especially some of the ones that have stepped up to serve an expanded area that have, again, those multiple offices, multiple staff, uh, multiple boards, and different groups that they're relating to right now. So in some ways, this structure will mean less work, probably for some of our uh, district superintendents. At the same time, the cabinet is at work to revise the policies and procedures for the district in some ways that may be helpful uh, to help them to do their job more effectively and more efficiently. I know one of the ideas that we have discussed with the DRT even, uh, many of your churches have made a shift to use the simple governance model, for instance, within your own church. And some of you have found that to be life-giving and really uh, help you to do your work in a new way uh, and maybe with less committee meetings, mm -hmm. but more focus in yeah. that leadership. Um, there's a way to use that simple governance model on a district level that may free up some of that time and energy uh, so that things can be done in a different way. So that's just one example. Um, but um, yes, that's absolutely a concern. And so that's also where we may have to shift some of our expectations. Uh, some of the things that maybe uh, are done by the DS that are allowed to be done by other clergy or other staff or other laity, uh, we may be able to equip them to serve in some of those ways that free up our district superintendents to fulfill their important role that they have uh, for our conference. And so um, those are definitely things that have been a key part of our discussions and certainly, uh, you know, want to keep as a part of moving forward with this. Another question that has come to our attention is, when will all of this go into effect? Latoya, you, you would uh, address that question, please. Sure. Um, the number of districts will be effective upon approval, and then implementation will take about six to 12 months. Okay, thank you, Latoya, for answering that question. We have four questions presently in our Q&A. Now it's up to five. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Zebert has indicated that to me. I'm gonna ask him to lift up those questions and then we will uh, address them accordingly. First question is, what accounts have been given for the health and welfare and wear and tear on our district superintendents? We, we did talk about that. And, and that was one of the things that, interestingly enough, when we met with the district administrative assistants, that was one of their concerns was for the district superintendents. But as Emily mentioned earlier that we, our hope is, is that by reducing the district superintendents to working in just one district, that will relieve some of the pressure they have of, of trying to keep two calendars in their mind all the time and two sets of committees and two sets of office 
holders and, and all that, that we reduce that debt down to just dealing with one set in, in one district. So we think that will be helpful. And, and we did talk about, as Emily mentioned, some other ways that, that we might rethink how the district superintendent uses his or her time and to take advantages of the new means of communicating that we have in today's world that we didn't have 30 plus years ago. So we think that will help in that process as well. But thank you for being concerned about the district superintendent because we sure are. And again, the numbers in terms of the numbers of churches, you think, oh, you're adding churches. Well, it still is within the range of what has been done yeah. uh, in mm -hmm. recent times. Uh, right. So, I, you know, I think that um, certainly that's a point to remember as well. Yeah. Uh, two two part question is, are we going to lose our current district superintendent? And in other words, if our DS is not the one rolling off, will we still be losing our current DS from shuffling? If I understand that question, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, the, the bishop mm -hmm. is the one to assign right. the district superintendents. Uh, obviously, any of us who are itinerant clergy, uh, you know, understand that we serve uh, at the will of the bishop in the cabinet. And so, uh, you know, we certainly know that there will be some changes. Uh, there will be changes throughout the conference. Um, already, several of our districts have experienced those changes. Um, so we, I can't, we can't foresee yeah. exactly who or where folks will serve. Uh, I know our bishop will work with the gifts and graces of our district superintendents to look at those uh, seven districts, if it's approved, to make the best fit for that time. So I don't think that's a question really we can an answer, yeah. except to say that. It's, uh, yeah, I, I would say it's possible depending on the realignment, but it's also just possible depending on appointments. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah, I think so. Uh, next question is, my district has churches in the same city in a different district. Right. Will that continue to be the case? I would we, say that, yeah. Go ahead. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Um, go that's possible. <laughs> I, I think we've talked about that, but, um, you know, it'll depend on how the district boundaries are set. Right. And we've talked about some criteria. Again, remember that that is the role of the bishop in the cabinet to draw those boundaries. So that will be their discretion. Uh, but some of our guidance uh, that we would be giving to them, some of the things we've considered, certainly I think that it's probably ideal mm -hmm. in general to keep counties mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Um, so we have looked at that. Um, and again, um, we're trying to look at all of the different scenarios and how different churches would relate uh, to a district. Uh, so certainly that there's still a lot of room to make those determinations, but uh, I think that a lot of people find that split between East and West Jackson along the I-55 at times to be a little bit strange. Uh, so that's, uh, if you see, at least in how now East and West are being served together, that gives us an opportunity to try something out mm -hmm. in this season that may prove uh, meaningful as, as those boundaries are being drawn in the future. Right. Uh, next question, what is the budgetary impact of this proposal? So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, uh, David Stotts has worked very closely with our team and provided a lot of information to us. Uh, the conference uh, uh, finance and administration, uh, certainly once the proposal would be approved, they are going to adjust and look at the budget and, and consider what those uh, implications would be. Uh, certainly, you're going to have fewer, well, we've already made the shift to have fewer district superintendents, so you have fewer salaries. You also have to anticipate some additional travel costs. There yep. may be some other areas Maybe that need support. to be increased, mm -hmm. additional support. And so uh, we're not able to provide you a number. I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm not the <laughs> conference uh, financial officer, uh, but I can assure you that that, uh, that group will closely look at this and uh, Going into this, our primary motivation has not been financial, though we certainly hope uh, that we can bring things to what we can't afford and what we uh, can spend. And so we'll be working closely with that group if this proposal is approved. Yeah. 
Will there be more multiple point charges per pastor? Don't know. I'm not sure that that really is something we are considered, have considered, or really is within our work yeah. mm -hmm. as a district realignment team. We're looking just at the number of churches, pastors, and district superintendents. We're not looking at a specific appointments. That's up to the cabinet and the bishop to make appointments. Uh, will pastors be kept in place until this is complete? <laughs> I think that's a similar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, has the idea of assistant DSs to assist in covering smaller areas and reporting out and communicating issues to the senior DS I guess been, been thought through or given thought? Well, we... There are some models of that in some other districts that we, in, in other conferences that we looked at, but um, the discipline doesn't provide for assistant district superintendents that can provide for someone to assist the <laughs> district superintendent, but you can't have more than one district superintendent appointed to the same place. But, but we did look at that and we have discussed some assistance on some level, but uh, some conferences, you know, turn that into a whole full-time position. We're not comfortable with even, we've talked about that, but that's not a part of our proposal that would become during the implementation time about what's going to work best for us in Mississippi. And that's yet to be determined. Uh, and a quick recap question is, how many districts will the conference have in the future? So I came on late and I missed the beginning. Seven. Seven. Is the is the recommendation the determination will be made by vote at annual conference? Correct. Uh, and let's see if districts are being realigned, shrinking. Will the conference office also look at their staffing? Again, that's not a part of our work as right. the district realignment task force, but. Uh, I'm sure there will be some discussion about, we did in some of the questionnaires, we did ask about what are some things that the district's now doing that the conference could do better? What are some things that the conference was doing that the district could do better? That was in the discussion, but again, that's kind of out of our, our uh, purview as a task force. And final question in the queue, when the district lines are drawn, will a central location for the district office be a consideration? Repeat the question again, please. When the district lines are drawn, will a central location for the district office be a consideration? I think that would be one of the considerations. Yes. Yeah. And the district superintendent yes. is the one that would determine yeah. the location mm -hmm. of the district office. Yes. Yeah. That completes the questions in the queue. Yeah, along those lines, as relate to that question, you just lifted up, uh, Jason, the district superintendent course make decision but be in consultation with the uh, district trustees in regard to that office yeah. yeah thank you all so much for your questions that you've submitted tonight uh, we are thankful as well for each of you that have attended this uh, very important uh, webinar tonight the recommendation will be presented formally during this year's annual conference session about the number of districts. After the recommendation is formally presented as clergy and lay delegates, you would have the opportunity to vote on the recommendation. I wanna give special thanks to uh, Jason Zebert as well as Jasmine Hain mm -hmm. for their technical uh, expertise, being the gurus that they are to help us to navigate through this informational webinar tonight. I want to lift up uh, some additional things. If you have further questions, please submit your questions to drt at mississippi-umc.org. Again, if you have further questions, submit your questions to drt at mississippi-umc.org. Also, I want to lift up our web link for the DRT, District Alignment Task Force, and that is mississippi-umc.org back slash realignment. Again, the web link is for the DRT is mississippi-umc.org backslash alignment. With that said, I want to end with a closing prayer. And again, this webinar has been recorded for future viewing purposes. Let us close with prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather tonight 
be with us as we depart from this webinar. Please help us to continue to walk in confidence and lead us with your truth as we move forward in the Mississippi Annual Conference, praising you and living our lives. Yes. Amen and amen. 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 Let us move forward with making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Go in peace. <laughs>